Welcome, folks. If you're in the right room, you're here for influencing without authority the foundations of a successful security department of yes. We're going to talk about how to leverage influence to drive security initiatives rather than edicts and authority. We're going to share some examples of initiatives we've successfully steered that we hope will open your eyes to the value of this mindset. And we're, and we're going to talk about well-meaning obstructionists, a department of no, how they impede the larger business, and how shifting to contextual enablement empowers a security org. A little bit about me. I'm Ari Kalfas. I'm a security leader and developer enabler. I've worked as a security engineer and penetration tester in the healthcare and financial industries. I trick people like Tim into letting me lead application security programs, and I currently run product security at DigitalOcean. Morning, everyone. Yeah, and there we go. Morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Tim Lisko. Uh, I have been in or adjacent to the security field for almost 23 years now. Um, I run right now our security engineering department, which is everything left of Bang, getting to work with amazing people like Ari, who didn't necessarily trick me, but one of the things that I look for when I hire people is people who can act as diplomats to the rest of the organization. Ari was absolutely one of those folks. So brief disclaimer that you will get sick of hearing throughout this conference, especially in DC. Ari and I are here not on behalf of DigitalOcean or our company. We're here as two security nerds and passionate security wonks, uh, helping move the security industry forward a little bit. We're going to talk. A, we're going to share a few stories, contextualize what we mean with this, and uh, go from there. So one last thing, we're also going to do something that most presenting coaches or guides tell you not to do. We're going to bounce back and forth a little bit. We just wanted to be level set up front. So Ari, take it away. So let's kick things off with a story. Imagine you are a, a product leader in your business. You spent the last six months driving some big new initiative. You've brought everyone kind of into alignment, all, everything's set to go live in two weeks. But then you get an email. It's titled Security Alert, and the body of the email says, please click here to read this important security message. Well. You've taken your phishing awareness training. You know not to, not to listen to this. But you ask a coworker and find out, oh, this is actually security's risk management platform. It, it, it's real. So you click it. It opens up a portal, something called Fletcher. And your password manager uh, has, a, has a login. You've been here before. OK, you log in. Shoot, it seems like it's been more than 90 days, and your password expired. OK, let's reset it. it takes about 15 minutes for that password reset link to arrive in your inbox. Then you click it. But oh man, that reset link expired after 10 minutes. You have to request it again. OK, this time you get the link, you reset your password, you log in. You can finally view this important security message. Turns out that security uh, flagged uh, one of the responses you gave to the questionnaire spreadsheet you filled out six months ago when first launching this product. They didn't like one of the answers to question 342. And so they've blocked your go live until you clarify that response. In a panic, you escalate to your boss, and they escalate to their boss, and they escalate to their boss. And a senior vice president signs their initials next to an item on the risk register, and everything's back to normal. Your go live is back on track. You have nothing, nothing you need to do um, for another year, at least, and then remind the SVP to sign their name again. So there's. A lot going on in, in that story, and it's a bit contrived, but I'm curious by a show of hands, how many folks saw elements of their security program or programs they've worked on in the past reflected in that story? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I think if we looked at each decision, every, each security decision, we'd have a good reason why that's there. But if we look at the holistic impact, the outcome of this process, on the business. Wow, security has set itself up to be a huge impediment. How did we get here? So I am a big fan of 
contextualizing history. It's important for us to look back to understand where we came from, to understand where we are today, and I think to help us move forward in where we want to go. But I'm not a historian. This is just my view of the past like 25 years of industry. Let's time box this to start back in like the mid 90s. We had a couple programs starting up, security programs starting up where maybe there was one person involved in the program. We fought tooth and nail to get a seat at the table to start influencing decisions. And we were looking backwards. We were looking at the technology that we knew that was in place but we understood that there was security risk in it already. We had to convince the business to look at it holistically. We got the seat at the table, and we're like, yes, we can deal with this now. Again, think of the time frame. Mid to late 90s, early 2000, we had all of the digital innovation coming into our workforces. We had finance looking at new ERP systems, HRIS systems rolling in, putting your entire manufacturing plant floor on the network and connect it. Risk exploded, but we still had these small teams rather anemic funding. So we started looking for levers that we could pull to help maybe slow down and just exert a little bit more control over the environment. We saw sectoral regulation pop off like HIPAA in 96 with high trust, following I think a decade later for the federal folks here. FISMA came out I think in 2000 Myriad state data breach laws that did something for us. Um, and then auditing standards. NIST coming out with frameworks like 853, CSF, and a few others. SOC 2, Type 2, ISO. We looked at all these control structures to help us get a handle on the risk. But along the way, because of those small team sizes, because of a little bit of anemic funding, and this relentless pace of digital transformation coming at us, we start saying no a lot. And we built a really disreputable name for security as the house of no, as the place where innovation goes to die. But those were the levers that we had to pull at the time. Ari said in his intro, well-meaning obstructionists. I don't think for a second that an industry that was founded largely on the backs of the hacker ethos of people who want to deeply understand technology and shape it to their will, their will, excuse me, want it to be an obstructionist, want it to say no. But it was just a confluence of events that brought us there. Those levers helped, and I think many of our predecessors in the security world thought that we were really smart operators when we were pulling those levers. We thought we looked like Einstein. In reality, business leaders were looking at us like Charlie Kelly from It's Always Sunny, explaining the Pepe Silva conspiracy. We looked absolutely insane to the board. Now, just context setting with a little bit of history, but it, like I said, it's really important to know where we came from and where we need to go. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Ari to continue the story. So now that we have, so now that we have a better understanding of how we've We've gone to this point and, and we started to introduce this idea of a department of no and as a business impediment and, and a department of yes, maybe as a business enabler. Okay, what actually differentiates the two? How do I know which one I'm in? If I could condense the department of yes into one word, it would be outcomes. Focus on outcomes, on impact, on value back to the business. One of my favorite quotes comes from Kelly Shortridge in a blog article about security obstructionism. She talks about a uh, department of no being focused on producing security outputs as a proxy for progress. And that's what we're talking about. A department of no is going to say, hey, look, we filed 30 security tickets this month. That's a 15% increase from the number of tickets we filed last month. Look at all the security work we're doing. And if you ask, what well is the actual impact of that work on the business, what risk was remediated, uh, I'd argue probably very little. That's what we're talking about, security output as a proxy for actual progress. A department of no looks to enforce their controls as mandates on the business, saying everyone has to, has to conform to what we're talking about. 
usually building that policy in a vacuum, right? Saying, hey, here's a control I want to put in place. Okay, this is how I'm going to, to institute that control. This is the date that, that control is going to go active. And probably no one's talking to anyone outside of security. They're rigid and inflexible in producing that, right? And so they set themselves up as impediments to revenue generating functions of the business and then complain that security can't get enough funding for its own program. The Department of Yes, on the other hand, as you might guess from our title, drives, leverages influence to drive security initiatives. They're going to be uh, contextual and flexible with how they are driving this out, involving the stakeholders that they're instituting policy against. They're going to be col uh, collaborative, right? not building that policy in a vacuum, whether that's through RFCs, common notices, feedback periods, some method of seeking and then applying feedback from the other area of the business that we're looking to influence. And if you only take one thing away from this presentation, see the next two slides. The Department of No looks at its coworkers across the business and says, they are the threat that I need to protect the business from. If only I could stop those coworkers over there from doing what they're trying to do, we would be secure. The Department of Yes, on the other hand, understands that those coworkers are the business. They're the whole reason the business is there. They are driving the business's initiatives. Security is here to enable those coworkers. Value back to the business, impact and outcome to provide that value. And so we think there are um, three uh, really good principles, uh, techniques that security programs can leverage to form their programs into these contextual, influential initiatives that drive value back to the business. Building relationships, creating coalitions, and establishing credibility. So Tim and I are going to talk through two examples of security initiatives we've run through this mindset that have delivered strong value back to the business as well as huge wins for security. Go. So recognizing that we are at the global application, or excuse me, uh, the global OWASP application summit, I am going to tell a story about corporate endpoint devices. There's probably two things that you think of immediately when I say that. One is that's going to be a boring story, and the second is probably the laptop that you were issued when you started at work. That laptop more than likely came in one of two flavors. You got a Windows device, or if you're lucky, you got an Apple device. Two platforms that exert a ton of control from an IT management and a security point of view baked into the ecosystem. But Occasionally, there is a reason to have Linux as a supported endpoint device in a corporation, in a business. Two examples, again, following Ari's contrived example uh, earlier, you could pretend that there is a business that sells virtualized compute that is built on the Linux virtualization stack. Or, since we're at a security conference, you could imagine endpoint device uh, security software. Sentinel-1, CrowdStrike, things like that, that also are built for the Linux platform. To build those products, you have to hire a very specific type of engineer, someone who knows deeply and cares deeply about Linux, advocates for the open source community, and those folks know Linux like the back of their hand. They know the kernel structure, they know memory management, IOPS, everything to build a product on that stack. They live and love and breathe Linux. And as a startup, going like taking this example all the way through, you, build the, you choose to build one of these products and you hire engineers that can help enable to, uh, to build the value for the business, to build the product, to take a market share. It's excellent. As you grow, you have to hire more and more of these engineers to help scale. And eventually, you don't end up with just Linux. That's not how the Linux ecosystem works you end up with 10 or 20 or 30 different variations of Linux. People love Arch or Gentoo or Ubuntu or CentOS or Temple OS. And they have a myriad configurations 
that trying to exert any sort of control over is going to be an impossible game. In the security department of yes, or excuse me, in the security department of no, a very easy answer might be to simply say, tough shit, no more Linux in this environment. But if you do that, this is the response you get. You evoke a mob. Now, funny Simpsons po posters aside, you actually create a very real risk for the business. You need those engineers, and you need them to be happy to continue developing the product, scaling the product, bringing market share and revenue into the business. But if you take away the thing that they love, you're going to damage the culture and potentially damage the product. So we have to think of how a security department of yes might approach this question. And the answer is yes and. Yes, you're going to get Linux, and we're going to have to exert a tiny bit of control. We're going to try to meet in the middle to maintain that cultural element that is so important. So very briefly, how we did this. This is something I had to go through uh, in my career that I think is instructive for the security department of yes. First and foremost, building relationships. In the example, I had about 200 to 250 folks using Linux at a place of, uh, in my career. The very first thing that I did was not talk to each of those folks because that doesn't scale. But I went and talked with their managers and explained and contextualized the problem that we had in front of us. We had to get control over this environment for a variety of reasons going public, we have to meet auditing standards, whatever it is, at the end of the day, we had to exert a little bit of control. Those managers provided an incredible amount of intelligence. They were able to tell me, because they know their people best, how their teams are going to react to this change, what they're going to care about most, and all of that was used to help influence the storyline that we would give back to this community. From that, we were able to have a meeting asked everybody to come who was going to be impacted, and further contextualize the problem. Here's why, here's the challenge that we have ahead of us. Here's why we have to change. And here's what we're asking you to change with us. Now, that meeting, we also asked them to share information with us about their use cases, their tools that our team could then use to help build out the environment that would be right for them. But most importantly, we also had not uh, allowed and acknowledged the emotional impact that this change would have for the business, kind of allowing them to process through the human emotions of everything. <clears throat> As they gave us that information, we created a build script for this environment. We didn't force an image that IT put on the laptops and shipped out. We allowed those engineers to build their own environments with a simple install script. Take vanilla Ubuntu, here's a script. It's open source. They can see everything, and they can contribute to it. That allowed us to create coalitions where these engineers started contributing to the solution. They were able to look at that install script, submit PRs, make suggestions on things to improve, and became fantastic stakeholders. For the value, most importantly, we were able to preserve a very important cultural element of this business, minimizing a morale blow and minimizing the risk to the business of these people attriting or leaving because suddenly their culture was decimated if we had gone to the Department of No route. And least importantly of all of this, we improved our security posture. Now, I'll hand it over to Ari to share an example that's a little bit closer to AppSec world. Thank you. So Tim talked about endpoint security. I'm going to bring it back to AppSec and talk about vulnerability management. I think vulnerability management is, is a foundation of an organization's security strategy. Or at the very least, it's one of the most common interaction points between security and engineering. And it's also the bane of everybody's existence. And, and I do mean everybody, right? Engineering hates the distraction Product hates the disruption, and security hates being made to feel like they're the jerk in the backseat of the car going, uh, are we there yet? Uh, are, are we there yet? Are, did, you did you fix it yet? Are, are you going to pick it up next sprint? And so we get breached SLAs, 
an ever-growing risk register, and a whole bunch of security output for very little actual outcome and progress. Did you know that there's a group of people that don't believe in birds? They're government surveillance drones. This is a, a satirical movement making a comment about conspiracy theories, but I have my own confession. I'm a member of a similar group. I don't believe in SLAs. They are not real. Everyone is always talking about them. They say you can see them everywhere you look. I don't believe it. They don't make sense. You telling me that this one's seven days and this one's 30 days, and, and you're my vendor, so I found something at seven days. Oh, wait, it's on my product? OK, it's a year. It's fine. This makes no sense. You go in front of your board, and you say, hey, that line of business should be prioritizing my seven out of SLA tickets and not trying to make more money. You, it, it's contextualist. It's rigid. It's inflexible. It's a department of no. Why is this the way we've chosen to communicate about meaningful risk to the business? What if we thought about the outcome we wanted to see in the organization, the impact we wanted to achieve, and worked backwards to something that would provide that actual value? I want, well, I want to get security engineers out of chasing teams and ticket SLAs. And I need to find a way to provide value back to the business so I can achieve that outcome while solving the business's concerns. I'm not the first person to come up with an idea like this, an idea of, of security debt. Uh, the Twilio security team has put out some presentations uh, about their concept of security debt. It's very good. Go take a look at those. And I'm not really going to talk about what our security debt program actually was, because that's not the focus of this talk. I'm going to talk about how we influenced the organization to uh, accept this change, to accept this new mindset, and to drive it themselves autonomously. So I started by, similar to Tim, reaching out to the stakeholders we were going to influence and ask them for their feedback. What did the engineers, uh, engineering managers and roadmap owners who own products in the business, who own vulnerabilities, what did they dislike about the current SLA-based vulnerability management approach? How, why was it not working for them? What signals did they want out of security that we weren't providing? And some folks are going to say they don't really want to hear anything from security because they're used to the impediment. They're used to the Department of No. But others are going to be pretty open about it. And so, OK, roadmap owners want to be able to build a roadmap and have confidence that that roadmap isn't going to be disrupted by security half a dozen times in a quarter. And I want engineers out of chasing those tickets and SLAs. And I want to make sure security issues actually get fixed. Right? I want to make sure we're still remediating risk in the business. And as I plant this program, I shall take a step back. As I develop this program, over a few months, I, I made iterative changes based on this feedback I'm getting from the stakeholders. And I kept meeting with them, saying, hey, is this going to provide you that value you're looking for? Are we getting closer to solving a problem for you? And then when I was ready to launch this and give it to the rest of the business, the rest of the leadership, I had those stakeholders in those meetings when I described the program as public advocates for the program. Over that time building up the program, I had already built, I had built this coalition of stakeholders. They had seen that this was going to be providing them value. They had asked for stuff, seen that embedded into the program. So okay, they're bought in. They're now great at, uh, they're now the coalition providing me immediate credibility for this new program with the rest of the business, with their peers. Not only, okay, are they providing us credibility, we had a specific stakeholder who um, had been having trouble getting enough investment by the business to kind of properly own one of the systems that was under their purview. Right? And as is common with an unmaintained system, there was a lot of security risk there. Now, a department of no would look at that individual and say, them, they are the antagonist. They're the threat that I need to protect the business from. Just look at all the vulnerabilities they have. They have to be the bad guy. But under this approach, the contextual approach, how can we influence change here? How can we provide value back to that stakeholder? We worked together and built a new business case, and it leveraged their debt score, which was high. And by moving it from this rigid, inflexible, esoteric 
made up thing that people like to call SLAs. Move it to something that made sense to the business. Uh, in this case, a debt score. The business understands debt. They know how to they think about debt every day. This conversation shift worked, and they got the investment they wanted out of the business. And so now this leader had the budget and the headcount that they needed to kind of own and, and, and build on the systems that they wanted to build. And then six months later, the security debt in that area dropped 73%. By providing that value back to the stakeholder, we turned them from someone the Department of No would consider one of the main you know, problems in the area, in the, in the business, into one of the strongest advocates for this security program. Not only did, all right, we, we, we delivered the value by providing that autonomy to the business that they were looking for, we got ourselves out of being that blocker, that impediment to vol management. They could run it self-sufficiently and actually reduce security debt. The business saw this framework, saw the more contextual approach, and started asking for that in other areas of the business. And so then the engineering started to turn their uh, reporting around engineering incidents into an incident debt score, modeled after securities program. And then we started to look at uh, product debt. What are customers asking for? What do we know we need to build into the product that's not there yet? And that gave leadership this really great holistic score of, OK, where do I need to invest more across the business? We have a, a concept of debt kind of across the board. Everything is, is being kind of talked about in the same way. And security drove that conversation. And so I hope we're, uh, we're starting to convince you that you know, this is an idea worth, uh, worth talking about. I'm just going to skip through a couple of notes here. All right. So I hope we're starting to convince you that this, this idea has, has some merit. All right? But I would be doing you a disservice if I didn't talk about some of the drawbacks of this, this Department of Yes approach. Things are going to take longer. It takes more time to sit down, have conversations with you know, folks, ex accept their feedback, make changes, get more feedback you know, on how it's going. It takes much more time to do all that than it is to just say, hey, this is the new edict, this is the new, ma new mandate, you have to conform. I'd argue it takes so much less time to drive your initiative after it's launched than it does uh, under a Department of No approach. Once you've influenced the stakeholders, they've brought in, they see the value that they're getting out of it, you, really can, you, know, you don't need to focus really any time at all on maintaining that initiative. It's being run by the rest of the business. You can divert your attention to your next project. And as you set yourself up to be this business enabler, this person who helps solve problems, people are going to say, oh, hey, can you solve my problem? They're going to turn to you and involve you in conversations that they previously hid from security. And so the number of asks of your time will increase. Um, and that won't you know, necessarily uh, lead to more headcount in budget to address all those new questions. Although, again, I will say it is so much easier to make a business case and say, hey, I need more people, I need more budget, because I need to help enable this other core business component. So much easier to make that case for security than to say, hey, I need more people so I can stop more folks in the organization from doing what they're trying to do. It's really hard to get that past finance. And so if you are interested in, in how they could start to move from a department of no to an department of yes and start to influence the organization, without authority, without mandates. Tim's going to uh, outline a, a high-level roadmap that you can take and apply to your organization. Thank you. So we contextualized, told a little bit of uh, uh, some stories, real-world stories that we have. Now it's time to get into the, how do you do this? So three big buckets that I want to talk through with you. This is mostly high-level strategy stuff. Um, but I find it incredibly, incredibly important building a program in, with the Department of Yes mindset. So the first one is starting with a listening tour. A listening tour is an idea of going out and talking to all of the stakeholders that you can get time on their calendar. Start with your team first, be it an AppSec function or a security function. S move out to business stakeholders that you have direct relationships with. And then from there, look at the partners that you might have ad hoc relationships with. None of these conversations need to take a ton of time. This is a 30 
maybe 45 minute tops conversation. When I say conversation, it's actually not. It's not really two way. You're gonna tee up some questions and listen to their answers. You only need to go into these sessions with three or four questions tops. Think of the old construct of like, what should security start, stop, or continue? And maybe close it off with a what keeps you up at night type question. Really open-ended questions to get folks talking. Don't try to solve anything in these conversations. Just listen and document everything that you can. If your company has recording capabilities and people are cool being recorded, record them so you don't have to split brain. Otherwise, just take incredibly fastidious notes. As you go through this listening tour idea, you're going to start, your brain will just start putting pain points together across stakeholders. Write those down, make note of them. Um, you're also going to have a really easy and natural, like conversationally natural idea if your program is aligned to the business in terms of what's important to protect. If you and the business agree on what the crown jewels are. And lastly, you're going to be able to understand where priorities exist and where they're different across the business. Make note of all of these deltas because there in those wedges are where you can find some amazing value to bring back to the business. After the listening tour, sit on the information. Let it kind of just steep in your head, review your meeting notes, and look for the pain points, the priorities, the crown jewels, you're gonna start laying them out into a strategy. This could be for your team if it's just an AppSec team or a product security team, or it could be for your entire function. Allow this to influence the entire strategy. As you're thinking through that, some of those pain points and problems that you solve, they're gonna be status quo problems. We haven't done this thing because that's always the way it's been done, right? Maybe patch management is hard because there isn't spare capacity. Could the security team partner with the capacity team and drive an additional investment to make that problem go away? Because that's really simple. That's a nice challenge to the status quo, low hanging fruit problem to solve. Focus on areas that receive the most constructive feedback from the listening tour. By constructive, I mean critical. Be open and invite critical feedback to your function. Because if you don't hear that, you can't make meaningful change from a department of no to a department of yes or advancing a department of yes. And as we've been talking about this entire time, as you're building your strategy, focus those initiatives that drive value for others, as well as the security team, but really driving value for the business holistically. As everything comes together, listening to our output, the notional strategy, you're gonna have to put this into a roadmap. I mentioned this just earlier, really quick wins, focus on low hanging fruit that drives value for others. If you have a conversation in that listening tour and can immediately turn around and provide some quick value that costs you essentially nothing but helps that business owner, do it, do it quickly, and build a relationship that demonstrates commitment and value production. You're gonna have to, you will have long lead problems. From those long lead problems in the roadmap, you're gonna need coalitions to go fix them. Can't just be security driving. Ari demonstrated with the security debt story. You need a coalition. You need change agents in the business. Form them and go together to solve really complex problems. And lastly, in that roadmap, focus on value for the business. Focus it on other teams and their challenges and solve for them while also helping push your program together. Now, we said it was a really high level. Happy to answer some questions. I think we have actually an abundance of time for questions. This is fantastic. Uh, so I think we might have a microphone. That's right. And if you don't want to ask questions here, you can hit us up on LinkedIn or InfoSec Exchange. Uh, yes. I don't know where the microphone's at. Okay. Uh, I'll repeat it for you. Just. Or like interest in kind of proactively coming to you. Like some people just sort of want 
yeah. to be involved in security, but some people aren't as used to it. And I'm wondering what it's... So for the recording, the, the question was how to help build relationships for folks who may have just naturally not prioritizing building a relationship with security. Is that a decent yeah. summation? Yes. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts you want to take away with? Yeah, I think you, you know, let me make sure I'm in here. Um, starting with uh, establishing credibility, right, that pillar, that becomes really important. If you can't, you know, if, if that stakeholder doesn't want to meet with you because every time they talk to security, it causes new problems for them, all right, well, we're never going to meet them until we've proven ourselves kind of in, in another function. So if they have peers in the same functional area, or stakeholders in the business where you can talk to them and solve a problem for them, and then take that back to that stakeholder and say, hey, look, you know, I, I delivered value over here. I, I solved this person's problem. Can I talk to you and maybe solve a problem for you? By establishing some early credibility with, with other folks that can, that can help drive that conversation. Yeah. I'll, I'll take it a little bit further. I mentioned you know, when, when Ari made the crack about tricking me into hiring him. I saw a very natural diplomat in Ari, and you can do direct diplomacy, which I would say is what Ari just argued. Also looking for ways for indirect diplomacy into that business unit or that leader. If you go on a listening tour, you might figure out some of their problems that they never told you about. And to Ari's point, solve some of those to just establish a little bit of credibility there. Um, unfortunately, there's no magic bullet in situations like that. You know, People are obstinate, and people have different priorities than us. And people have different um, preconceived notions of what security should be. But one of the things we mentioned in the it's not a trap slide, it takes longer to do this. And it takes a lot of effort to do the change management necessary to build this. But it's worthwhile at the end. Thank you. Um, so only maybe, um, well, do women in SLAs. <laughs> so, um, Yes. In the system, others. But even if you just think of it as cover my behind, you know, situation, right? Like uh, we published those SLAs because later we could say we told you so, right? So, um, you know, can you comment on did you did you still have to keep SLAs? Right? Okay, what is it? Yeah. So. Um you know, I definitely come from regulated industries too, although you know, now with DigitalOcean there's a little more flexibility. But with, um, so let, let me re repeat the question. All right, so organizations that are maybe regulated have to then you know, prove out uh, an SLA or at the very least say, I told you so to a business function if, if something happens and, and they didn't have fixed it, we had communicated that it should have been done you know, earlier. Is that the yeah. summary? Yeah. Um, Two things there. Um, yes, we do still have numbers associated, maybe with an issue, but they're not SLAs. Uh, we actually, we call, you know, they're they're remediation recommendations, <laughs> um, and what they are is well, we'd have to get into a whole whole extra talk about uh, security debt, but. We instead track how much debt is accruing across the li each line of business and how fast that debt is accruing. So we can say, hey, here's, you know, your risk is, is rising really rapidly, and here's a threshold of risk that we think is, is comfortable for that area of the business to hold, like a credit card limit type of thing. And so we can, we can still talk to businesses about, hey, your debt's rising too fast. You're going to hit your threshold. Maybe you should think about prioritizing. Um, but stakeholders can self-sufficiently kind of prioritize their own issues. Yeah. And in that model, we're still able to then report to you know, our auditors on, on adherence and on timelines. And the remediation recommendations, not SLAs, they go into that, the, the function of how fast the debt accrues. So if it's a lower risk issue to us, there's all, you know, maybe that's, you know, we'd expect that to be done in 90 or 180 days or something like that. Um, that becomes part of the uh, calculation and the debt rises kind of slowly. It's a higher risk issue. That number is going to be smaller. The debt will rise faster, and that naturally draws teams to kind of prioritize that value. Um, but it became, uh, you know, it honestly became less of a conversation we had to have mm -hmm. because with, excuse me, with the the kind of the stakeholder management we had done with the engagement with the influence, um, teams were 
by and large self-sufficiently driving their debt below these thresholds. And so we were able to sh show that tickets were being fixed kind of within the SLAs we might have had expected. But we, you know, that's not even a conversation we have to have anymore because right? they're, they're, they've kind of handled it. So it's in some ways kind of a, maybe a solved problem, but there's still then the reporting and metrics we can put around how that debt is being kind of assessed in the business and, and you know, driving down. We're just no longer talking about arbitrary deadlines. We're talking about kind of context, contextual to each line of business, what's going on there and how does that risk impact that, that product. Uh, you, I think you had your hand up first. Yeah, you're always going to end up asking people to do stuff. And so the best way to get credibility, I found, is to explain the exploit. Other than, otherwise, they think, did you have to get a check mark on your CISP exam to get that? Yep. So once you explain the exploit of what can go wrong, then they really realize you're just not asking it for the hell of it over your job. Absolutely. And so that gives you all sorts of stuff after that. One of the, sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Either by NPES findings, or at least the logical thing you see they can do is, if you can't, you might, if you really demonstrate it, then they're, they're scared, then they'll be happy. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I say often amongst the, the teams that I run is, I, I never want us to be perceived as being capricious in any of the guidance that we put forward. So utilizing something, pen testing or a red team partner to show that attack pathway, especially up to the business when they always want the third party, uh, is incredibly valuable. But just like the Linux endpoint story, contextualizing the ask as part of the change management of that initiative really helps guarantee success. Uh, I think you had your hand up as well. I did get one more thoughts on it. Okay. I, just, I was just looking for Please. examples Yeah. Like that. I was uh, curious about, you know, like some example questions, but I think it'd be better to follow up offline that would be sure. contextual. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, that framework that I listed, the start, stop, continue, it's actually, it, it is a shockingly simple and really powerful framework to ask, uh, to ask stakeholders just those three questions. That's yeah. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. At least some of this sounds like understanding the customer. 100%. Uh, some of this, is this, this one, um, yep. uh, at least some of it sounds like understanding your customer experience design, things like that. Have you found uh, any luck partnering with or getting insight from other people in the business who like face like similar challenges or approaches? It's what the listening tour is, is all about, that entire concept is finding those similarities and the deltas most importantly. Um, because all of those people that you go out to talk to, the stakeholders or partners, whatever word you want to use, they're ultimately your customers in a security department, right? Uh, when you're horizontal across the whole business. So it is getting to know them and their pain points, their desires uh, for what they need from you. But yeah, and it, uh, we have partnered, um, I, I've done this a few times, where you look at other cross-cutting functions and also go talk to them about what some of their pain points are, right? So like. It's just a, a matter of organizational construction will influence the approach a little bit. Sorry, that's hand wavy, I realize, but each business's context or each business's context is just slightly different. Hi, um, can you explain a little bit more what goes into the debt score? And specifically, I was thinking, is there like a factor there about uh, like an old issue staying there and being stale, and like does that increase the, the debt score? Yeah. Um, I will, would need a, like a whole other talk to go into it. And I, I, will, I will give a second shout out to Twilio's security team. Has a you know, security debt project that, that inspired kind of the, the ideas we took away. And so there are presentations out there that go into it in depth that, to go look at. But um, yeah, I mean the whole, I think a really crucial function of there is, is moving from something that's rigid and inflexible to something that's contextual to what, what you're trying to solve and in, in something that's to your business. So you can pick and choose what what goes into that score? Is it okay? We have a lot of problem with you know issues not being fully fixed, and so the reintroduction of an issue is a multiplier into the score because that's the problem we need to solve. Okay, that, that impacts you know how that debt accrues, stuff like that. In that case, is the score comparable between teams? Yes. Uh, like uh, something that we can say, like, hey, see these people are doing a lot better. 
That is, that is something we did shift um, in, in the way we talked about it. We, we, you know, we would report across you know, the lines of business, but we were picking uh, thresholds that were specific to each line of business to say, okay, for this area of the business, you know, it's, it's customer facing or it's internal or it handles this type of data or handles that, whatever. That means this area is more risky than this other area. So the threshold of debt that we're comfortable you know, with this area assuming, it's lower or higher. And so then it does become more challenging to then say, all right, how's this organization doing versus this other organization? The thresholds are different. It may not be a direct comparison. But we can still talk about kind of adherence to each group's threshold to then say, oh, OK, you know, 90% of this line of business is kind of adhering to the threshold that we've mutually kind of agreed upon. This organization, only 70% are. So that org needs to maybe kind of uh, uh, improve. A funny byproduct of this was even though the thresholds were a little bit different across the different business units, pending, depending on the, the risk tolerance, uh, we still saw gamification across the teams. As soon as we had those dashboards comparing everybody together, everybody was racing to zero, which was really cool and not what we were going for at all. We were actually like very explicitly saying, you don't have to jump on these things, but everybody wanted their debt below their threshold. Uh, so that they could kind of maintain a steady state there. It was uh, actually incredibly fun to watch, even though all of the change management that we were going through with this was like, this is explicitly the behavior that we don't want to see. <laughs> uh, all right, I think we are at time. Ari and I are happy to take more questions outside. Uh, my understanding from the OWASP team is behind on the table, there's two cups and green or red chits of paper. If you liked what you hear, put a green thing in. If you didn't like what you hear, put a red thing in. I don't know. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much.